Hello and welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. It's good to be with you. My name is Gerard and I'm a member of the congregation here at Swan Bank. You join us for the last in our series of the week that changed the world. We've had the supper, the betrayal, the accusation, the denial, and today, the trial. All five talks, of course, are available on Swan Bank's YouTube and Facebook page. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that we will trust it, that we will live our lives by it, and that you will forgive us when we do neither. Father, we pray that you will deepen our understanding of the things that we read today, and in some way be able to apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, our reading in just a few moments will start in John chapter 18. It's a little longer than some of the other readings that we've had in this series, but first, a brief introduction. The trial is a courtroom drama like no other, and John's gospel has the most complete version of those events. It is full of twists and turns, brutality, false accusations, injustices, and manipulation. Remember that the background to the trial is that the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. In the accusation, Catherine reminded us uh, that Jesus had claimed to be the Son of God. Uh, and in their view, Jesus had committed blasphemy. And according to their law, the penalty for blasphemy was death. But they couldn't kill Jesus themselves now that they were under Roman law. So they were determined to get the Romans to do it for them. They were seeking to use Pilate, who was the Roman governor, um, to do this for them. And Pilate happened to be in Jerusalem at that time. So we're going to read from John chapter 18, starting at verse 28, through into verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 16. And it says, Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, uh, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, 
they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So, in verse 29, Pilate went out of the palace to meet the Jewish leaders because they wouldn't come into the palace to meet him for ceremonial reasons. Pilate doesn't waste any time and he says, what charges are you bringing against this man? The actual charge was that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. But they didn't say that to Pilate, um, not at that point at least. He says, what charges do you bring against him? And they say, well, he's a criminal. A claim to be the Son of God wasn't going to be enough for a Roman court to convict and execute Jesus. But in verse 31, it makes it really clear that that is exactly what the Jewish leaders intended to happen. And Jesus knew that was what was going to happen. He had prophesied it. He knew he wasn't going to grow old and die in old age. Jesus knew that he would be lifted up and crucified. And crucifixion was a Roman method of execution. So it had to end this way in a Roman court. Back to Pilate. Right at the start, Pilate tries to pass the buck and he says to the Jews, you judge him by your own law. But they reply, we have no right to execute anyone. Which actually, that bit was true at least. Yet it didn't try, stop them trying to stone Jesus on at least two previous occasions in John's gospel. And actually, it won't stop them stoning Stephen in just a few weeks' time. We're going to see here how the word king becomes a key issue in the trial. In fact, it's uh, Pilate's first question to Jesus in verse 33. He says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus does go on to claim to be a king, just not of any world that Pilate would understand. In verse 38, Pilate says, what is truth? As one commentator put it, it was standing six feet in front of him, yet he couldn't see it. Jesus was and is the truth, and many still can't see it. You may have found yourself feeling sorry for Pilate. Let's have a look at that. He does appear to be in a no-win situation. But always remember, he could have released Jesus because he believed Jesus was an innocent man. Three times in the passage that we have just read, Pilate says, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Instead, he decides to take a risk, a risk that will backfire on him. He gives the Jews a choice. He says, shall I release Jesus or release Barabbas? He must have thought he was being really clever. Surely the Jews would choose to release the man of peace over the man of violence. Except when he put it to the Jews, they shouted, 
release Barabbas, not Jesus. Well, we don't know much about Barabbas, but what we do know is that he was a, a rebellious and violent murderer, and yet he walked free. By contrast, Jesus was a man of love and of peace, and he went to his death. Hold that thought for a moment. How much must the Jewish leaders have hated Jesus to allow Barabbas to go free and terrorize their streets again? The truth is, Pilate <clears throat> shouldn't have tried this. And that was his first error. But he's then about to make another error, and this one is worse than the first, because in verse 1 of chapter 19, we see that he has Jesus flogged. Surely, I guess, Pilate was thinking that would be enough to placate the Jews. But as we know, it didn't work out that way. The whip that was used in a Roman flogging was made of leather and it had little pieces of bone embedded into it. And each horrific blow that fell on Jesus' back would have ripped it to shreds. Flogging was a cruel punishment. Usually when a person was flogged, um, they went mad or they would die in physical agony. Remember, Pilate believed Jesus was an innocent man, yet he had him flogged anyway. What kind of a judge was he? Well, we know from history that Pilate was indeed a brutal man. Um, and we see that played out here too. In Jewish law, if you go all the way back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 25 verse 3, it states that a criminal uh, should receive no more than 40 lashes. So the Jews uh, would only give a criminal 39 lashes. But this uh, was a Jewish punishment, and what was about to see here was a Roman punishment. There's no reason to believe that the Romans would follow any kind of Jewish tradition, so we don't actually know how many lashes Jesus received. In any case, Jesus wasn't going to die by flogging. He was going to die by crucifixion. Do you know that in the Old Testament, where animals were used as a sacrifice, there isn't a single example of an animal being tortured before being sacrificed? And here we see Jesus, the Lamb of God, being tortured before being sacrificed. And Jesus knew that all this was going to happen to him. Yet he went through it all willingly for you and for me. That focuses the mind, doesn't it? What will our response be to that? The soldiers probably stripped him. They certainly dressed him in a robe. They rammed a crown of thorns on his head. They smacked him in the face. And with mock reverence, they shouted, Hail, King of the Jews. And to make Jesus' humiliation complete, we read that Pilate then brought him out to stand in front of his accusers. And then in verse 5, Pilate says those hugely profound words, Behold the man. This is the man when Jesus was but a few days old. The prophet Simeon said of him, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. We see that here. He was certainly spoken against and it exposed the hearts of those who hated him. If only Pilate had realized at that point who this poor, beaten up, pathetic looking figure really was. Pilate, he wasn't just an innocent man. As your own sign said, he was the king of the Jews. And you missed that. Caiaphas, he really was the son of God. It wasn't blasphemy. And you missed that. It's hard to imagine the total dereliction of duty that Pilate showed in having Jesus subjected to a torture like that. It's also hard to imagine the level of hatred that the Jewish leaders had for Jesus in screaming for his execution. It's also hard to imagine the humility and the obedience and the love 
that Jesus showed throughout the whole ordeal. You know, we hear the account of Jesus' trial so often that we become numb to the shocking reality of it all. And we fail to stop and to think how horrifically he was treated uh, by those he actually came to save. The torment that he endured was prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah 53 verse 5, a very well-known verse. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds or his stripes, we are healed. Stripes here, of course, is a direct reference to the lashes that Jesus received from the flogging. So they cried, crucify, crucify. Some preachers have speculated that this was the very same crowd of people who waved their palm branches just a few days earlier when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Certainly, we can all be fickle in our response to Jesus Christ. How many of us actually blow hot and cold depending upon the circumstances that we find ourselves in? But in verse 6, it does tell us that it was the chief priests and their officials who shouted, crucify, crucify. Anyway, then comes Pilate's third error. Remember back in chapter 18, Pilate had tried to hand over the trial to the Jews and that failed. Now in verse 6, he tries to hand over the execution to the Jews and that will fail too. Finally, the Jews tell Pilate what they are accusing Jesus of. We have a law, they say, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now that was either blasphemy or it was true. It was true. In verse 8, we read that Pilate was afraid. Why was that then? Well, of course, there are lots of possible answers one of which is that he risked having a riot on his hands. Um, but one reason may be that if we jump into Matthew's gospel, we read that Pilate's wife sent him a message that said she'd had a dream about this particular Galilean. She'd sent Pilate that message to say he was innocent and to have nothing to do with him. But perhaps there was actually more going on here than that. Perhaps Pilate was actually afraid of Jesus himself. Perhaps he thought he was from the gods. After all, of course, the Romans had a lot of gods. That would explain why he asked Jesus, where do you come from? Note that Jesus remains silent to that particular question. And that appears to rattle Pilate even more. But could it be that if Jesus had answered the question, where do you come from? that he might never have gone to the cross? What if Pilate had been persuaded that Jesus actually had come from heaven? Might he then have been persuaded to let Jesus go? In verse 11, Jesus only speaks to Pilate to tell him that his power comes from God and is limited by God. But there's also some other interesting words in verse 11. The one who handed me over to you it's not clear to me who Jesus was referring to by that statement. Uh, but the prime suspects are, of course, Judas Iscariot or uh, the high priest Caiaphas. But whoever they are, notice that they are guilty of a greater sin. And that raises a very provocative question, really. Are some sins worse than others? That seems to be what's implied here. Nowhere in the Bible can I find a verse that says that all sins are the same. But I can find several verses in the Bible that say the penalty for all sins is the same. Do you know that the good news of Jesus is that Jesus can save us from that penalty? We only need to believe in him and follow him. Thank God for Jesus. Then comes a major plot twist in verse 12. Pilate changes tack, and then he does what he should have done in the first place. He tries to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders also change their tack, 
uh, and they play their trump card. First, you'll recall that way back, Pilate had already referred to Jesus as the king of the Jews. And as we know, he will go on to repeat that by writing it on a notice above Jesus' head on the cross. It will say, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But the Jews now pick up on the theme king, and they use it against Pilate. Pilate. They tell Pilate that he's failing in his duty to Caesar if he lets Jesus go. And that really was the death knell for Jesus. They had finally got Pilate exactly where they wanted him. I have often wondered whether this was some kind of premeditated or crafted plan. Or if the Jewish leaders simply seized on the theme of kingship uh, as the events unfolded. Of course, they had now managed to trap Pilate with the threat of disloyalty to Caesar. And faced with that, this was actually only going to end one way. I mean, you've got to hand it to those Jewish leaders. It was a masterclass of manipulation. They must have felt very proud of themselves. Ultimately, of course, Pilate valued his own life more than the life of this deluded king who stood before him. And Pilate probably couldn't cope with the thought that in seeking uh, Jesus' execution, the Jewish leaders would appear to be a better friend to Caesar than he was. That was never going to play out well in Rome or for Pilate. So in verse 15, Pilate asks, shall I crucify your king? But did you see that? After all that, Pilate asks them, what he should do. The Jewish leaders pull one more stunt by pledging a false allegiance to Caesar. We have no king but Caesar, they cry. But then finally, of course, Pilate caves in and hands Jesus over to be crucified. And that was, of course, his fourth, final, and ultimately fatal error. So that was the week that changed the world. And now the stage is set for the climax of that week. The three greatest days in history. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way the narrative records everything in so much detail here that we are able to see exactly what Jesus did for us, the whole ordeal leading up to the cross. We think too of his betrayal, the accusation, the denial, the flogging, the mockery. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to save us. Lord, we thank you that he went through this so willingly for us, Help us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. Save us, Lord, from becoming numb to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Father, I pray that as we read this narrative all over again, that in some way you would help us to live our lives differently, that we would be good witnesses of this same man, Jesus, to those around us, so that we might see them too, one for him, in whose name we pray. Amen. I just want to remind you that there will be some questions um, on a link on the Facebook page if you want to explore this passage in a little bit more detail. God bless and thank you for listening.